Welcome to CanAge Conversations. I'm Laura Tamlin Watt, CEO of CanAge. And today we're talking to Greg Shaw from the International Federation on Aging in our Champions of Change program. Join us to learn about his beginnings in Western Australia, his work with local Indigenous communities in Australia and Africa, his work at the Canadian and the global stage at the UN and the WHO. It is a warm and slightly hilarious CanAge conversation. And I know that you'll enjoy it. Make sure to sign up for all other CanAge conversations at canage.ca and sign up as well for a free membership at canage.ca slash join. Thanks very much. And let's head over to our conversation with Greg now. Welcome to CanAge Conversations, Champions for Change. I'm so pleased to have with me my dear friend and hero, Greg Shaw. And Greg comes from Australia and is now living in snowy, cold Canada. We're going to get into how that felt when he first made his arrival. But first, let's start by welcoming Greg. So thank you so much for joining today, Greg. Uh, it's my pleasure, Laura, and I, uh, I look forward to the conversation today. Well, let's start at the very beginning. Where are you from originally? Those of you who are tuning in can hear that the accent is perhaps not typically Canadian. No, it's uh, not Canadian. So originally I'm uh, from Australia in Perth, Western Australia. So born and bred in uh, Australia. Um, but I do uh, cherish my Canadian citizenship. I also have British citizenship and Australian. So I uh, multinational. Well, and that becomes a bit of a theme that I want to delve into because you have been working really on a multinational and a really a global scale for years. I didn't realize you had UK citizenship as well. Yeah, no, that's uh, because my father was British. So um, I managed to uh, secure British citizenship as well. So it makes it very easy when I have three passports for traveling anywhere in the world. So it's um, really advantageous, that's for sure. So Perth is perhaps one of the most remote cities in the world, isn't it? On the side of of Western Australia? Yes, Western Australia, and it is designated to be the most uh, remote uh, city in the world. So it's a long way from nowhere and hence the um, very low number of COVID cases in, in particularly Western Australia uh, for the last um, eight months. So tell me a little bit about growing up there. What was your family like and, and paint me a bit of a picture. All right, so I'm um, the middle child. I have uh, a younger brother and an older sister. Uh, my mother was Nina and my father was Bernie. Uh, my mother is of Scottish descent. And if anyone's been to Scotland, our family name is Urquhart. So if you've ever been to Loch Ness and been on the ruined castle of uh, Urquhart, that is our old family castle. So. Um, that's a little bit of um, history about uh, uh, my mother's side. But my father was uh, in the Second World War, didn't talk very much about it, uh, but uh, had many medals um, given to him, which we ended up getting from the Australian War Museum after he passed because he didn't want to have anything to do with his war medals and remember, remember much of his time um, in the Second World War, particularly in the Philippines and Japan and um, in that particular neck of the woods. So, so he was in the Asian theatre then? Yeah, he was in the Asian theatre. Uh, but, um, you know, I can, uh, growing up in Perth, we had a holiday house, just like you have a holiday house at a, a nice location. We had a holiday house in a place called Moor River. That's where we learned to swim, drive, fish, um, do all those wonderful things as families do on uh, weekends away. And it was only a short uh, trip up the coast. So uh, that's where we spent most of our youth and the times growing up as a family. And it was always as a family. So it was a very close family. Um, and the thing, one thing I can remember about my parents is I can never ever remember them having an argument and neither can my brother or sister. So um, I wish we could all say that. I wish we could say that too. That's a story. Yeah. Yeah, it is. No, uh, but they were remarkable people. And I remember when my father passed away, he, he said, you know, I said, you'll be remembered for lots of things. And he said, what I want to be remembered for is what I've given back to community. And if you can take that with you before you die, giving back to community, um, that will be the best legacy you could ever leave. Well, that's a legacy that that you have been living for many years now. So take me Take me a little bit. So you're leaving then your childhood 
bubble and you're heading off to your study, where does that take you? Well, I have a very strange background. So um, I left high school when I was 15 years of age uh, and went to a, a place called Wembley Technical College because at that time I wanted to be a surveyor. So they did a, they had an engineering surveying um, diploma at uh, Wembley Technical College and I undertook that particular diploma. Um, and then at the age of 17, started working for the Australian Survey Office. And I ended up being articled with the Australian Survey Office to become a licensed surveyor. Um, and I spent most of the 10 years in the Australian, in, in the outbacks of Australia and in the oceans of Australia, uh, doing both land surveying and hydrographic surveying. So it's a far cry from public health where I basically sit today. But from my background when I was um, surveying, I spent many years actually living in remote Indigenous communities in the northwest of Australia and did all their what was called at that time as constructed surveys. So doing the survey of all the communities in terms of buildings, sewers, roads, all their networks. So you could actually get, develop uh, good plans for those particularly Indigenous communities. And, and most of those trips were six to eight weeks in length living in Indigenous communities. So I got to know all the remote Aboriginal communities, particularly in Northern Western Australia, very well. And they knew me very well. So I had a real affinity with the traditional landowners um, in the Kimberleys of Western Australia. And then moving to hydrographic surveying where I was at sea most of the time, and it really, did play difficult, it was a difficult time, uh, particularly for a young family, because I've got two boys. Um, Ryan is now the age of 41 and James is 39, uh, both in Australia. And um, I decided that I wanted to make some changes to my career and structure. So I then moved into property acquisitions and leasing for the federal government uh, Department of Land Administration which was still part of the Australian Survey Office. Um, so I moved into the land acquisition phase of that particular uh, department. And at some point in time, um, the Department of Health in Australia wanted someone to sell off their rehabilitation centres, um, particularly the one in Western Australia. And I was seconded to the health department to basically sell off the Melville Rehabilitation Centre and then set up a network of small um, rehabilitation centres across, across Western Australia. Um, and I suppose from the work that I did with the health department and them knowing my background and interests, they were then talking to me whether I wanted to stay or go back to, the, to land administration and whether I'd be interested in working with them to look at how we might be able to develop some services which really were targeted towards supporting remote Indigenous communities in Australia. Um, so I was seconded again, stayed with the health department, um, looked at development of an Aboriginal aged care strategy which was implemented across Australia for remote and Indigenous communities in the development of both home care services and long-term care uh, services in and within those communities. Um, so looking at marginalised community groups, that then led on to um, me working with um, multicultural ethnic community groups in Western Australia, looking at how we might be able to develop specific aged care services to support those particular marginalised and minority community groups. Um, and during all that time, I was back at school doing health administration, um, social role, valorisation theory, contract administration and negotiation, quality assurance and accountability, all through Curtin University and the Australian Institute of Management were most of um, those particular courses. So I became really um, interested in the public health side of serv service provision, particularly around supporting older people. And um, that was basically in 1986 when I started that work. Um, stayed with the Department of Health and Ageing right through to 2003 before 
picking up um, our roots and moving to Montreal in Canada for the International Federation on Aging. So that's a little bit of uh, my background. You moved to a technical college, became a surveyor, surveying the land, worked into remote Aboriginal communities, surveyed water, and ended up as the deputy minister. Yes, uh, so, yeah, I managed yeah uh, in the health in the Australian Health Department. So it's a, a very strange transition. So not too many people would have such a diverse uh, or strange transition to the public health arena, and mine certainly was uh, a strange transition. But it was really because of the work that I did in remote communities in the early years when I was surveying that I could actually go up to any community and I was known in those communities. So it was very easy to sit down with the elders and architect that I would take along and talk to them about how we can develop a building or a service or a program which would meet their cultural needs and also meet some of the cultural traditions that they had. So if you're going to build a long-term care facility and someone was going to die in that facility, which is pretty normal, um, the tradition is that they would vacate that facility and leave it for six weeks before they would then smoke it to get rid of any any spirits left in the in the building. Um, and you can't have that when you've got um, many residents in a long term care home. So it was working through some of those issues and getting agreements with elders how some of those things could be overcome, which um, there's a very successful long term care system now supporting Indigenous communities across Australia from a lot of that early work. And it wasn't only me that was doing that early work. There was a number of us um, across the department, across Australia, which were working towards um, the goal of having an Aboriginal aged care strategy. And that would have been, you know, globally, some of the first times that, that would have happened, really. I think about historically, there wasn't a rich tradition of doing culturally integrated Indigenous health and aging? No, uh, or ethnic. Um, and when I think back to Australia in the late 80s, early 90s, I think they certainly led in uh, provision of care services for Indigenous communities and for the needs of multicultural um, communities um, in Australia. So very much uh, defined and designated specific for their cultural needs. Let's talk um, about cultural needs. So you left Australia, a warm yeah. location, and you ended up in Montreal in the early mm. 2000s. How was yes. that transition? Um, well, um, as people may know, um, my wife, Dr. Jane Barrett, who's the Secretary General of the International Federation on Aging, um, was offered the job as the um, Secretary General. Um, she said, yes, our intentions were probably to look at coming over for just two years to, for her to run the organisation. I had a two-year paid sabbatical from the federal government. The minister had agreed that um, uh, it was worth uh, me still doing some work for the department, but in that time I was also working for the IFA um, on a voluntary capacity, really. Um, and then after two years um, at, in Montreal, you know, it was do we go back to Perth or do we look at staying and helping build the IFA to uh, what it's become today? And um, we stayed. So 17 years on, we're still here, but uh, not in Montreal anymore. We're now located in Toronto, but working globally and worldwide. When you moved to Toronto, okay, you left the temperature of what and arrived to the temperature of what? So you left Australia, what temperature? Well, um, Christmas Day or several years ago, I remember uh, speaking to the family from Montreal, and I think it was probably minus 30 with the wind chill on that particular day. And in Australia, I think it was 46.5 degrees Celsius. Um, you ever seen so snow? I had never seen snow. Oh, well, no, I had seen snow. I'd never been in snow. So at the age of 45 or 46, I, uh, we ventured down to um, Smuggler's Notch and I spent a week learning how to ski. So um, now I'm a, a devotee of skiing. So um, um, love it. Well, time to go to Whistler with all the other Australians then. That's the, that's no, the no, that's where I probably wouldn't want to go. So no, uh, Breckenridge or somewhere like that would be, uh, is, or Utah, that's, that's for me. 
I want to take you a little bit further. So the work of the International Federation on Aging has been extraordinary. It is the global leader. And when we're thinking about, you know, the organizations that have made profound changes in the lives of older people, IFA is, of course, at the very top of that list. But Greg, you've traveled the globe in this role. And so from your small start in Perth, you have been, you know, all over this world. But one of the places that you spent quite a lot of time was in the African continent as well, wasn't it? Yes, I've certainly done some work in Africa, particularly around building capacity programs to support uh, smaller NGOs in looking at uh, how they can develop capacity to deliver services um, in African communities, whether it be remote or in town. Um, worked with the South African Human Rights Commission and the Department of Social Development when they were considering how do we look at developing a a national advisory, seniors advisory committee to inform government on what the issues are across um, South Africa, particularly for older people. And then later um, spent quite a bit of time in Mauritius, working with the Mauritius government, uh, developing what they now have as their national observatory on ageing, providing advice to government on um, policy and programs to support older people in that country. I asked Jane when I spoke with her not that long ago if there was an aha moment for you, a time that you can think about where your, your world shifted or you were struck by a particular issue that that made a shift in your thinking. And I'm curious whether or not you've had a, you know one or two aha moments in your life that have changed your view or your trajectory. Um. Look, I think it's probably predominantly my work around the Age Friendly Cities and Communities Program with WHO. Um, You know, I think some of the earlier times when Akita City in Japan wanted to become part of that particular network and spending time on an annual basis with the local government in Akita, looking at what they can do to make things improve the environment and services to be more age friendly for older people and seeing the commitment that they had was really an eye opener for me to the extent where where you know they really have made transformative changes in a key to city to make it more age friendly for the aging population right down to those that are visually impaired um, with, you know, and crosswalks and streets and cutouts and buildings where visually impaired have um, uh, reminders going into buildings and in, within buildings, outside buildings, um, crosswalks that have a designated section for people walking and a designated section for people on site bicycles. Um, And then seeing how that particular movement has grown um, over the years since it was first looked at. And it wasn't, it certainly wouldn't be where it is today without the support of the Public Health Agency of Canada in the early years when Dr. Uh, Louise Plouffe did work with WHO and Alex Kalashi um, in Geneva around that particular program. And it's moved from there to, you know, places like Iran, where I would go and teach all the municipal bodies within Iran over a period of a week around the age-friendly programs, what they could do, what they can't do. To be able to have that uh, foray into places which you normally wouldn't think is age-friendly has been really quite remarkable for me. And people often ask... um, So working at the IFA for 17 years, working in government for 25 years or in public health in in Australia for 20 years, even though you were looking at Aboriginal aged care strategies, ethnic aged care strategies, you know, did you achieve more there or have you achieved more at the IFA? I think the influence that we've had at the IFA to improve the quality of life of older people has been far more than I could ever have managed imagined just within my bubble in Western Australia and working with the Department of Health and Ageing. So it's been a remarkable journey and one that I wouldn't want to change for anything. It has been an incredible arc and and kind of coming back to your own home, you're now living in Toronto 
and and you've become very very involved as well with hearth and home in a sense of supporting the senior strategy in toronto and the accountability roundtable tell me a little bit about how that came to be and some of the some of the work that you think is going well in your own home of toronto right now with regards to age friendliness or senior strategy oh now where should i start um there is a real commitment clearly by the city of toronto to be age friendly um, how age friendly Toronto is, um, is debatable. Um, you've only got to try and access restaurants where you've got bathrooms on the same level as the dining areas to know that um, it's not that age friendly in some um, circumstances or some cases. Um, but there are elements where there, there is a real commitment. And I think the, the mayor of Toronto, John Tory, has made a, made a commitment to being more age friendly. And I think age friendliness is a lens which they, they look at when they're developing their aging stra their strategy for Toronto. So it's really important. And the importance is shown out by the commitment of um, the mayor of Toronto signing on to the WHO age friendly cities and communities programs. You know, we're in the time of COVID-19 right now, and you know, you have been one of the forefront voices talking about the Australian model of long-term care, and that certainly helped to inform our thinking at CanAge. And I wonder if you could just take a moment to share with us some of the differences in responses between Australia and Canada, particularly with regards to older people in long-term care. Well, um, the significant differences in long-term care. So if I look at Ontario, I think probably 30, around 33% of the bed stock is double rooms or more um, in, in Ontario. Uh, double room provision in Australia, across the entire country of Australia is probably less than 10%. Right. Um, most people have single room with ensuite within their room um, and that's been in place for the last 25, 30 years. I remember um, before I left Australia, I would vet plans for long-term care homes. And if a building was being built for 70 residents, there would be 70 individual rooms, all with en suites. Um, and there may be um, a couple of rooms with connecting doors for a married couple if they were um, in that particular situation. The big difference here, multiple um, wards or multiple bed wards and um, minimum standards of one washroom, oh sorry, one bathroom or tub room and shower room per 25 residents or, or resident home area in the facility. So how can you deal with privacy, dignity, infection control when that's the current minimum standard? And the argument is, well, if we put on suites in every single room, it would be too expensive to build. And uh, um, I would used to hear arguments about the same thing in the disability sector when people were saying it really is difficult to get a, um, a bus that's got wheel wheelchair accessible and the cost for modifications for those buses was very expensive. Well, they're normal now. It's part of the normal fleet that people can can purchase. It should be part of the normal fleet within the long-term care home that it's single rooms, en suites, um, that you can isolate people when there is infection outbreaks in homes like influenza or COVID-19 and there isn't the capability to isolate um, people in the facilities today. So, you know, I, I talk about Canada as being really innovative in a lot of programs and services and facilities that they have. But do, does that innovation translate to best practice and adoption more broadly? It generally doesn't. Um, so um, they're something shown as being useful, but they don't get funded. So how do they actually maintain and get those systems in place? And without government supports, um, they don't, they won't work. The other interesting fact is that within the Australian long-term care system, private for profits and not for profits and church and charitables are treated e equally, exactly the same. So 
a private for profit or a charitable would get the same level of funding from government in terms of the per resident term based on their level of care. Um, capital funding assistance where homes need to be improved and, and uh, updates done, uh, they're all eligible to those particular services. Um, the amount of fees that homes can charge any individual is consistent right across the church and charitables to the private sector. So it's the same. Whereas here, it's not the same. It's very different. So the church and charitables have a different fee structure than some of the private for profits. And there isn't the government control within that long-term care system here in Canada that there exists in Australia. The other big difference is quality of care standards. Mm -hmm. How is quality measured? How are those standards measured? Um, and that then determines whether homes are meeting standards or resident care needs or not. Um, and in Australia, significant sanctions are put on homes where they're not meeting those standards to the extent where a home could be closed or an administrator put in over and above the home operator until such time as those um, issues are resolved and there's a continuous improvement plan endorsed by the government to remedy those particular concerns. Um, I think in 2018, there were 3,300 visits to long-term care homes in Australia, um, unannounced visits, whereas here in Ontario, there probably would have been less than 10. Yeah, nine. You know, so, yeah, it just, it's, it's like, um, what's the difference between chalk and cheese? It really is. Um, and, uh, and I don't know why there isn't a real onus and a real push and a public outcry to actually improve the quality of care standards. You know, so we've got governments saying, okay, we're now going to mandate that four hours of personal care work for each individual resident. And I, my argument is, well, you don't need four hours mandated. What you need is a good quality assurance framework and measurement of those particular resident outcomes, which then stipulate, does it ends up mandating for the home to meet those needs, they have to have a certain mix of staff um, on to meet those needs. I think it's a retrograde step uh, mandating staffing hours um, as opposed to improving outcomes. The, um, the Australia model is certainly something that CanDH has been very informed by. And as we're having conversations with government right now, you know, the challenge that we are always getting in Canada is, of course, because of our division of powers, you know, it's sort of like nothing can be done because it's the other person. And we routinely look to the Australian model and say, you know, they have a very similar division of powers. And, yes. yet, and yet it is possible. So it's, it's very inspiring. I want to I want to just kind of circle back and close and thank you. You've been doing this a long time from your career. Uh, in surveying now to, you know, a global impact, working with the World Health Organization, working with the United Nations, working with, you know, communities and governments around the world. Is there a career highlight for you that, you know, if you could sit back at this time, and I know you never sit back on your laurels, but I'm going to ask you to think about it anyway. If you, a career highlight, something that you are especially proud of that you actually achieved. Oh, dear me. There's so, there's so many things that I'm, I'm proud of uh, my work at the IFA. But I think, you know, if I look at my history and my career, is the, is the um, difference I made in supporting Indigenous communities in Australia with the development of, of aged care services in those remote communities. That, um, and then moving into ethnic communities, that would certainly be a highlight. Working at the United Nations and sitting on a number of WHO committees has certainly been a significant highlight. And just being asked, uh, my skills and knowledge being recognised here in Canada and being asked to sit on expert committees or being asked by government to have input into policy development where appropriate. I think that's something I could never want more of or want more for. Um, I think having your knowledge and skills called upon where you can actually make a valued contribution to the country in which you live and you call home, I think, um, um, you know, is the highest possibility or thing that I could ever 
want to do or be remembered for that I've made a contribution here in Canada. Yeah, I want to build on that one little piece. One of the things that you and I have talked a lot about is the importance of building more capacity in the sector of aging generally across the board. Any advice to people who are perhaps in their teenage years and perhaps in their cities or remote villages, any advice that you would give younger people to think about in terms of encouragement for a career in this field? Um, it's a really rewarding area to work in, working with and for older people. We've got to remember the sacrifices the older people themselves have, have made in their years, particularly my parents' generation, the generation before them, um, First World War, Second World War, the Depression, um, uh, and they've built the backbone of the nations in which we live to a large degree. And we've got a lot to be thankful for in that we today um, have the things that we have. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have them. Um, so we've got a lot to give back to older people in this community, recognise the contributions that they have made, not only in the past, but their ongoing contributions to family and community, whether it be them volunteering, grandparenting roles that, that, that um, members have. It can be really rewarding and, and enriching to work with older people just to hear the wisdom um, and the knowledge that they have from the years gone by. So you can learn something from the past. I often talk about, um, I often hear today about COVID fatigue. You know, we've had COVID fatigue now for nine months. You know, my mother in the Second World War, she didn't know whether my father Bernie was dead or alive. She would get a letter from him once every six weeks when he was in theatre. Uh, in between time, she wouldn't know whether he was alive. Um, think of the people in Britain during the Blitz and that, that time that went, that went on, the fatigue that they would have been feeling. And those periods were much longer than what we experience in COVID-19. And I think people just need to show patience and resilience um, today that, that older people showed back in the 40s, 30s, 1900s. I mean, it's, you can learn so much from older people and it can be really, you can really value what you do in your contribution to support them. Well, we can't thank you enough for all the work that you are doing to raise that awareness and to make real change in the lives of older people. I'm reflecting back on your words of your father about, you know, if you can make this type of change, then you've had a life well lived. And I think you're not anywhere near being done it, but you've already, <laughs> you've already uh, done, you know, things I'm sure your father would be very, very proud of. And you've got another whole half of your life left to do it. So, you know, yeah. don't give up now. We need all the help that we can get in our space. I, I, I just wish he and my mother were still alive to, um, to see what's happened, um, what their son has achieved. Um, and that's, that's the, the sadness that you, to, you have in losing parents. Um, my mother was in a nursing home for seven years uh, with dementia. Um, and she wasn't the mother that I remembered from my early childhood. Uh, she was a shell of a woman, but uh, equally she would be as proud. Um, and just to relay a very brief, funny story. Back in 2006, we did some work with uh, Hillary Clinton with the White House on Aging um, Conference. And we did some work with her um, um, on some lecture tours with her, uh, both Jane and I, and we had a number of photos taken with Hillary Clinton. And I remember sending one to my brother who took it to the nursing home where my mother was and had it hung up on the wall and staff would come in and say, oh, Nina, is that a, who's that a picture of? And my mother would say, that's um, my son, Greg, and his wife, Jane. And they, they and she would, <laughs> and my, and, the staff would go, oh, I don't think so, Nina. I think that's Hillary Clinton. And mum would say, oh, is it? Is that who he's married to now? <laughs> so <laughs> it was very, a very funny talking point. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it's those sorts of memories that, uh, 
you know, bring joy to you and, and you, you think you need to keep going in this field because it's one that brings uh, really cherished moments in time. Well, congratulations on your long-standing relationship with Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> with, uh, uh, with my grandmother who had significant dementia, we had about the same conversation you know, kind of every day yeah. for about five years. And, and sometimes, you know, she would ask me, you know, if I, if I liked living on the farm, and of course, I just <laughs> asked, I didn't live on a farm. But of course. Live on yeah. And then she would ask yeah. me if I liked the smell of frying onions. And I would sometimes say yes, and sometimes say no. And it would no. either direction. <laughs> no, <laughs> so it is a... so important, those memories, it, those smells, those but it, thoughts. But it's even those conversations, which, are, you know, aren't cohesive but they are memories that you can cherish and hang on to absolutely you know? and absolutely. every time i fry onions i think of her yeah well and now every you. time i see a picture of hillary clinton i'm going to think <laughs> of you craig this yeah. has been wonderful thank you so much for being so generous most welcome time today this is yeah, been... most welcome this has been one of our Can Age Conversations Champions for Change, and Greg Shaw certainly epitomizes that title as a champion of change. From his small starts in Perth, Australia, surveying to becoming deputy minister in the field of aged care in Australia, to working at the United Nations, the World Health Organizations, and to helping to promote positive change in all of our communities. This has been a wonderful opportunity to spend some time with you. Thank you so much, Greg. Thank, Thank you, you Laura. for joining us today. This has been CanAge Conversations Champions of Change. We hope that you have a chance to follow our other conversations on social media at canage.ca slash webinars, and also join us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and all the other great places that you can follow us as well. Don't forget to sign up for a free membership for CanAge at canage.ca slash join. And if you're interested to learn more about the International Federation on Aging, follow our links and go to ifa.ngo and learn how you can become involved as well in the International Federation on Aging. Thanks so much, Greg, and thanks to all of you. <laughs>